Trev's blog. And there's young Oliver there, sporting his Trev's Bobby Dazzler star haircut. Be careful there, young Oliver. You'll be beating those fair maidens off with a stick. In fact, I can't see my matching under sheep for chicks. Apologies for it being so long since the last video, but I'll talk more about that at the end. So this video comes straight off the back of the last one, which was all about getting your sections all butted up, tacked together, and fitting really, really well, ready for welding. I'm gonna skip over the welding process because I already covered that at the beginning of the TIG welding series. So this video is all about heat distortion, how it happens, why it happens, and how to straighten it out after it happens. Very important stuff. This was a collaborative project with Chris Cadle from Outline Displays who makes this wonderful glass blown neon sign. And uh, his contact details are in the video description. So let's get on with the video. The first part of this demonstration is gonna seem a little bit obvious and simplistic, but we need to go through this to get to the next stage. So please stick with it because it's gonna start getting much more interesting in a while. So what have we got here? Well, we've got a big block of metal to act as a ballast to strap my digital caliper to. Digital caliper has got the locking screw undone so that it can freely move back and forth. There is no resistance or very little resistance on this. I emphasize this point because this is something that I really want to get across. There is no resistance here, okay? Got this rod I've made up. I ground the ends like this so that it can be gripped to the jaws of the caliper. With the grips now in place, what I next need to do is turn on the digital caliper and zero it. I'm going to heat up the rod with my gas torch. You may notice a funny flame pattern with a gas torch. That's because I'm not burning pure acetylene. So with the gauge set to zero, I now heat up the rod. So we've watched the rod getting warm, see that it's glowing red and it's well and truly expanding. So we we'll zoom in on the gauge and we'll watch the gauge climb and then go back down again, just to indicate that we can see that as the metal is getting hot, it's expanding and as it's cooling back down, it's contracting. I know it's all a little bit obvious, but to some people it won't be. And I really need to explain this part of the process first before we can get to the next part because it will be invaluable information to somebody that's watching. Okay, so we're back to practically where we started from. We're on 0.01 millimeters. I feel the rod is lukewarm, tiny bit of warmth left in it. So we're pretty much there now. So what's happened is, is the metal's expanded and it's contracted to exactly the same place as it was before, pretty much. Um, tiny little bit of discrepancy but that could be because there's slight warmth in the apparatus now whereas it was freezing cold before I started. If you can imagine that this panel is actually two panels and this is going to be the line I'm going to weld along. So this is two panels separated by a gap and this is tacked together. Now I'm going to perform the weld. So as the welder's welding along it's creating all those stresses in the panels by the constant expansion and contraction of the welded area as I move along. And this is why you get a vast amount of distortion when you weld um, a panel because it's less than a millimeter thick. So it hasn't actually got that much rigidity to the material. And what you will find is that when you come to a more structured area of the panel like this lip for example so this lip here has got quite a nice fold all the way along it and then it goes around the corner so this part of the panel here would certainly be the strongest part and you would experience the least amount of distortion 
up here where it's just flat so this is just a flat panel very low crown surface this is where you would experience the most amount of distortion because you haven't got the structure to support it so as you were welding along you'd be welding along and directly where you were welding you'd have forces all pushing out all the way around and like that pushing out as the material expands and then as you moved past that the arrows of course would all be facing back in as it was contracting again and this is what moves me on to the next part of the demonstration because this story isn't as simple as this if this is all that was happening all we'd have to do is just basically straighten up the panel so it's all buckled and distorted we could just simply get a hammer and dolly just go over straighten out the distortion and everything would be back to perfection but of course it isn't as simple as that what we find is that when we straighten things out it's almost as if the panel has taken on a mind of its own it's actually changed the shape of the panel and this is what i'm going to come to next if i was to remove a slither of steel from a car body panel let's just say it was one millimeter thick and i removed a small section one millimeter wide and magnified it it might look something like this just use your imagination guys so let's put this into test condition so in the next demonstration i'm going to show you what happens to a section of car bodywork when it's welded and we get something referred to as heat shrinkage i'm going to show you exactly how this happens and if you were confused before then i certainly don't think you'll be confused after watching this demonstration you'll enjoy this I'll just give you a moment to analyze this piece of apparatus that I've made. I've made it out of an old car body straightening jig bracket. It's made out of 12 millimeter thick steel with a very thick piece of box section in between. It's extremely rigid, good point to make. I've welded these U sections on each side and these U sections are to support the bar that I showed you just a second ago. And this bar just about fits in there very little wiggle room at all so that fits in there just like that a point of this is this is an extremely rigid structure going back to what I was saying earlier when I was using the digital caliper it was free to movement there was no restriction there and with this there is a great deal of restriction this is an extremely strong bracket I need to measure the exact size of this square bar before I start the demonstration so we have approximately 122 and a half millimeters long 122.50 11.84 11.84 all the way down one side and 11.95 11.95 11.95 all the way down the other side so now we know the exact dimensions or the approximate exact dimensions if that makes any sense of this bar before we start the demonstration very important to measure this before we start and not remember halfway through I'm going to heat up both sides of the bar because if I only heat up one side the bar may well bend in the bracket so I'm going to go from both sides trying to give it some even heat distribution between both sides if I was using a thinner material it may be more effective to use as a demonstration uh, the main problem with that is it may also buckle a lot easier that's why I've used something a little bit thicker Not reach the temperatures needed for welding of course if i was welding it would be getting far hotter but this is just a demonstration to see the forces in action that's the whole point of what i'm trying to do here i think that's plenty good enough I'll turn it off allow this to cool down so 
I can lift it now because that's trapped in there of course. This has had around half an hour to cool down. Just slightly warm maybe. Yeah, the rod doesn't look dead straight anymore. It certainly looks like it's got some kind of distortion going on with it. The most notable thing is that it's so slack now in the bracket. Loads and loads of play, whereas before there was only a tiny amount of play, I don't know, say half a millimetre worth of play. If I didn't lift it out exactly square, then it would catch on the sides. And now I can lift it in and out at any angle virtually, and it's just falling in and out. So the next thing I'll do is measure the dimension of the rod now that it's gone through the heating process, and we'll compare the new dimensions to the old ones. 121.33 and now the sides so we've got 11.87 one end just gradually growing as I move it to the center so get it on the center 12.30 11.87 the tightest I can get it 11.87 try the other side Okay, the tightest I can get it there, 11.98 in the center. These figures speak for themselves. I don't feel like I need to talk you through each and every part, but the difference being that the length has shrank by 1.17 millimeters, and the sides have gained nearly half a millimeter right in the heat affected zone, right in the center, where you would expect it to, because of course it's far more malleable being hot. The ends have also taken on a little bit of extra material, as you can see, and this is because of the compression of the material around the weld as it's expanding. So you can imagine there's enormous forces going on. That heat affected zone is pushing out really hard and it's actually compressing the cold steel as well, actually shrinking that down slightly as well. So in summing up, in the first demonstration, the conclusion I come to was that you could heat the metal up it would expand and contract to exactly the same position it was before because there was no restriction. In the second demonstration, this piece of apparatus acted as a expansion block. As the metal was heated, it expanded until it had nowhere else to go. And then it took on extra thickness because that is the only place the metal could go was to make it thicker. Once the heat was removed then, of course, it just shrank back down, leaving the bar shorter than it was before, which is exactly the same way it happens when you weld in a patch in a panel or weld two panels together. Going back to the panel, as you were welding along your welded joint, you would have a heat affected zone, which would be a spot like that where it's glowing red hot. Of course this spot here is super hot and malleable, so this is where the most amount of action will be going on. Surrounding the heat affected zone will also be an area of great compression and this will also shrink This is because of course all the forces are Initially kicking outwards. So it's always trying to expand out away from the central zone This panel is acting like the piece of apparatus. So this here is the expansion block This whole panel is preventing the expansion from going anywhere else and creating thicker material in this area. When you're welding two panels together, so this is one panel and this is another panel, you're welding the two together in this area here. As you're welding it together, we know that this area shrinks, which means the distance from point A to point B gets shorter. As most panels are convex when you're looking at them on the outside, and this gets shorter, it always invariably means that because it gets shorter, the distance between there and there must become less, and it means that it ends up dipping in to take a shorter path. And that's why you end up with a dip where you've welded. So to restore the distance from point A to point B to where it should be, we need to stretch these two back out, which is exactly the same it's what we need to do with the rod. If we want to make the rod back to its original length, we need to stretch the rod out. Well, 
the only kind of practical way you can really think about stretching that out would be to attach one end to something that was solid and a massive weight to the other and try and pull them apart of course this is completely impractical especially when we're talking about car body work so the only way to do it is to actually compress the material the way i compress the material is by sandwiching the material between the blow of a hammer and a heavy metal object so with a good few sharp blows of the hammer i've restored the length to the bar in fact i've slightly over restored it slightly more stretched out than it was before so it's a little bit tighter in there than it was before i performed the experiment i can appreciate i've dumped a hell of a lot of information on you already but there is just one more principle to take into account that does make a huge amount of difference when we're looking at this piece of apparatus this piece of apparatus overwhelmed the expansion of the rod now when we're dealing with welding in things and expansion and contraction thinking about overwhelming things is a very good place to look at so when we're looking at like a piece of panel work that's got to be welded as i said right at the start if you can weld something just off the fold the strength in the panel will overwhelm that expansion and contraction process to a degree you're always going to get a little bit of heat shrinkage no matter what happens but you'll get far less in a stronger part of the panel like a bracket being made without a jig it's going to pull out of all shape but if it's welded together mounted into a jig then it will pretty much stay in the position it is when you unbolt it from the jig so now i'll return back to the sign making project where i stretched out the welds using a panel hammer and a dolly and a beating spoon. I've got the sides all welded up and I'm not too fussed about the sides because there's a great deal of shape going on and that shape is holding that panel quite rigid. So I've welded it all the way around anyway without really doing any planishing and it's resulted in some quite nice sort of features. I mean this this side is just sucked in slightly, almost to find that shape there. I quite like that. I'm still going to planish it, of course, that'll relieve a lot of that. I've got quite a bit of heat distortion across here. So that's not very good across there. So, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to planish it all out really, really well before I start welding the front face. It's the front face I'm most worried about. You can see I've already had to do some heat shrinking just from tacking it. So I'm gonna to have to sort of take a different approach to the front face. I have to do a few little short runs and planish in between. And I'll give the, I'll give the sides a good going over first before I start the front. I may just take the tops of some of these welds off. I've got a bit carried away here and there with a welding rod but at least I won't have any undercut to any of the welds. The punishing out if this was normally on a car of course I would be able to get access from behind very well so it would be very much a case of getting a dolly. I mean there's a flat section along here so you always want to sort of replicate what the underside shape needs to be with the appropriate shape dolly. So that's flat across there so I'll do I'll just put that underneath there and give it a good beating out not really um not really sort of over analyzing what i'm doing too much i'm just beating along where it was welded and what that is doing of course is it's straightening up the buckled metal work and also stretching the well back out which is putting material back into the panel and stretching it back out to put it back into the shape that it should be and i just literally just go around all the welds with a hammer and dolly uh, just just doing that And 
I've got um, I've got a bit of a low spot here, so again you see this is a more of a curved section here, so I'll put the curved part of the dot underneath. And another real useful bit of kit is my smooth spoon slapper. Sort of metallic-y sound and not the so you always try, always try and listen out for the dolly underneath because if you're not contacting with the dolly all you're doing is denting the panel in and you want to sort of raise it up and stretch it out you want that compression of the steel okay so I've got a tiny little bit of a hollow just there, so I'll put that underneath there. Bring that up a little bit. It's all feeling pretty good. I've got the sides planished out, well, as good as I want to get them for now anyway, and I'm going to turn my attention to the top now, because obviously this is all welded up. Just got round here to go. And um, what I'll probably do is do 10, 15 centimetre long runs and planish as I go along because this top so flat, anything, any sort of heat that's going to go into this is definitely going to disrupt the shape of this. And if you let it start going and just continue, so if, if I just run weld that all the way around there, this would just be one huge hollow afterwards and it might not even be salvageable. But if I keep chasing it, uh, keep sort of bringing it back to where it should be as I go along, then I should be okay. I mean, everything's salvageable. It's easy to get your knickers in the twist with jobs like this. Um, but usually it's because you haven't done enough stretching out, I find. So I always do all my stretching out. And then if I've got any high spots afterwards, I always address the high spots after I've raised all the low spots. I think I've covered this before in another video, but it doesn't hurt to say it again. It's just the, the technique I found that works the best because once you start shrinking down high spots and you haven't got all your lows up, there's a good chance you could have absorbed that high spot into the low by bringing the low up, if you see what I'm saying. So let's start welding the top. I got all the joints completely welded up now and they're all planished out, it's come out as well as expected. Have got heat distortion issues that I'm gonna to have to deal with next. Some of the welds have come out really well, particularly pleased in this area. I've got just the right amount of filler rod. The weld is almost flush with the top of the steel so there'll be no undercut and not much to grind off either. Can't say the same about all the welds but a long ears come out really really well. A couple of tips I picked off, up off some other guys um, about increasing the amperage and increasing the speed that I weld at. So there's, they said about 30 amps, that seems to be the sort of general consensus. My problem is I can't see what I'm doing. And I genuinely mean I can't see what I'm doing because I have got some damage to my eyesight. And, you know, if this is as good as I'm going to get, then I'm still quite happy with that. So what I'm going to do now is just grind off the tops of the welds like I did on the sides. But I'm not going to go too mad. Like I say, just the tops with the 36 grit Cubitron 2. And then I'm going to switch to the roll lock where I've got a bit more control over, a bit more finesse. I take the welds off. So they're nice and flush so I can continue planishing and messing about trying to get it as flat as possible. I'm also going to put the belt sander around the insides as well just to take any tiny bead off. The more beads you get rid of 
the more finesse you'll have because you won't be folding the material around the bead. Quite pleased with how it's come out. A few little problem areas, but nothing too horrendous. It's come out pretty much as I expected. And I have got, obviously I've got heat distortion. So I've got a low here, but I've got a bit of a ridge going on around here, sort of sticking up, almost where the weld is. So what I need to do first is to take that down. So I'll hammer that around there, get that as flat as I can before I start trying to raise this. This side, I've got high spot here, so all oh, this is high. Um, the rest of it feels pretty good. I've got a few bits that need a bit of attention, but nothing too seriously. So what I'm gonna turn my attention to next is just going around hammer and dolly, just sort of finessing a few little bits that aren't quite right. And once I've done that, then I can start raising my low spots on the flatter areas. Oh, we can see where we've made contact you see and that's the point of the teeth as well is to also highlight where you've gone because bit of an opportunity here to sort of work in another tip I've got a slight issue here it really isn't that bad and to be quite honest with you if I probably just gripped it up and kept on working it with a hammer and dolly probably get around the issue but you can probably see that this side is stepped out compared to the inner. So that piece there is stepped out by not quite the thickness of the material, but probably getting on for it. And if I just literally welded that now, there would be a big step, of course, when I come to grind it off. What I'm going to do is I'm going to grind that outer piece very, very thin. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use the heat shrinking effect to help me out here. So what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to run the TIG welder along this edge. What that will do is it will heat shrink the edge, may give it a bit of a hammer as well while it's still hot just to help things along. And uh, I could have used my oxygen acetylene torch but I'm just going to use the TIG welder. So I've got the TIG welder set up. Had to do exactly the same the other side as well. Just cannot spend enough time getting everything dead flush before you start wilding it, and it's always time well worth spent. Well, 
well thanks very much for watching i hope you enjoyed the video as much as i enjoyed making it it is absolutely sensational to be back making a video at long long last and i just literally haven't been able to do it because i've been so tied up for time with the catering business uh, no sooner I thought I had a window of opportunity coming up and then something had to be addressed and I really really need this business to work because if it doesn't well the consequences don't bear thinking about do they so it seems to be going really well things are flowing much better than they were I haven't really had that many problems apart from starting a, a brand new business right in the middle of a pandemic I mean how how much worse could it get than that really so yeah it's been interesting but it's all good and i'm really really enjoying myself you know despite what some people will probably think it has been great fun and um, fantastic really enjoying it um but i really enjoy making videos so it's uh it's been a it's been an issue there but like i say i'm really glad to be back finally so what's the next video gonna all be about well I keep getting lots and lots of questions about different welding processes, a lot about brazing lately. So what I'm going to give you is my own sort of opinions on uh, MIG brazing, gas brazing and TIG brazing. And um, what I've come up against it isn't going to be a definitive guide to welding. None of my videos are. They're just my own opinion on them, like many other YouTubers. It's just their own thoughts and opinions and uh, mine's just the same really and uh, I'm going to talk about the cold welding phenomena that seems to have swept the internet um, sort of certainly last year it was happening still getting questions about that so I'll give you my own jaded perspective on that one so that'll be the next video and hopefully it won't be too long before I crack on with that one so until then I'll say bye for now <laughs>